Let me remind you a little bit about the, the background of the letter because that's, a, as I say, not filler. It's very important to understand because we are in, in some sense, as I say, reading somebody else's mail and it's important to understand what's going on uh, if we're going to do that uh, properly and accurately. Now, James is a letter. It's from the Lord's brother, written around, I think, a, a, a good estimation, a good educated guess of when it's written is around A.D. 45. It's written to Jewish Christians outside of Palestine, and they perhaps had been scattered from Jerusalem and its, and its confines by persecution, such as that you see in Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Most of the addressees, most of these Jewish Christians to whom James is writing, they were poor, and they're poor uh, Christians who are being oppressed by their unbelieving rich neighbors. And I went through last week and read some texts, and we'll, we'll look at those again as we go through the letter, but I pulled them, all to, pulled them together to show you where that's coming from, this idea that they are being oppressed by their unbelieving rich neighbors. They were also experiencing ethical problems in the form of anger and evil speech, favoritism and various sins of division that, that James addresses. And he, he comes at them, we would say he comes at them hard. But, uh, you know, that's the Spirit of God saying that these things are important and need to be corrected. Now, all of those sins they were dealing with, they may have been related to their oppression and dislocation. And I'll explain how that uh, makes sense to me to see it that way in, in a bit. Now, contrary to the opinion of uh, many scholars, I don't look at the book of James as kind of a, a, a collection of isolated statements or, or addresses of isolated topics that are simply stitched together by various catchwords or catchphrases. I gave you the, the uh, quote from uh, James Thompson. He says, yeah, no, it's like the book of Proverbs. I don't see it that way. I see it as a genuine letter. That, in other words, it's something that has sufficient continuity of thought to qualify as a genuine letter. I see it as a genuine pastoral letter written to encourage and strengthen these poor Christians who are being oppressed by their rich neighbors. In uh, chapter 1, verse 1, you have the greeting, and we talked about that. And one of the things that's amazing where he you see his uh, attitude toward his brother, Jesus. But in chapter 1, verses 2 to 12, James is encouraging his readers to endure the oppression that they're experiencing by the rich. And he does this in several ways. In verses 2 to 4, he reminds them of the spiritual benefits that accompany those trials, though they're difficult to undergo. Trials are never easy to undergo. He encourages them in their, in their experience of these trials by reminding them that there's something beneficial to undergoing. Though they're hard, they're difficult, they produce something of greater value than the pain that they cause. And that's spiritual maturity. See, and with that perspective, he says, look, if you see that, if you see that there is this benefit that comes from them, this overriding benefit, something that is more important than the pain that you experience in the trials, that perspective, if you have that perspective with that, one should at least at some level rejoice when they come. Now, I say at some level because when you're getting the hammer, you see it at another level, you're crying. But he says rejoice, consider it pure joy at some level because you know that God is at work in this to bless me spiritually that though I'm suffering, he is working something higher and greater. So at some level, he says, listen, you're to, re you're to rejoice. It's an opportunity for growth. So he's encouraging them, knowing that they're experiencing this, by first saying, look, there, he reminds them of the maturing effect of trials. Hold that thought, and it will help you. Then in verses 5 through 8, he encourages them to endure oppression by reminding them. He reminds them in, in these verses, verses 5 to 8, that the wisdom that's especially needed in those times of suffering and persecution is available from God for the asking. See, he will give them the wisdom that they need to discern the right course to take. As I said last week, when you're suffering and when you're being oppressed, when you're experiencing hardship and faith trials, 
it's easy to lose sight of what is the right, the, the wrong road begins to look easier. You see, so you need wisdom to be able to see that, but you also need wisdom to recognize and internalize that God is at work in these things. So, there, so trials and difficulties create a special need for wisdom. He encourages them in their enduring of these trials by saying, first, there's this maturing effect, but also the wisdom that's especially needed in trials is there for the asking. And then he cautions them and he says, look, it's there for the, it's there for the asking, but the asking must be done in faith. You see, and then he mentions this thing that the one who doubts will receive nothing. And when we ended last week, I was suggesting to you that the doubt that he has in mind here is what I called a strong kind of doubt, a basic division in the believer that brings about wavering and inconsistency in attitude toward God. Okay, it, it's a very strong kind of doubt, and that seems clear from the second part of verse 6 down through verse 8 where the doubters portrayed as the wave tossed by the wind. And I said that wasn't, see, this is a Jewish picture, and it's not talking about a wave that is purposefully or directively going toward the shore. It's more like swells, you see, that are blown all around, and they, they, they're not stable. They go in any direction, the way the wind blows them. And in fact, the, the, uh, the person's labeled a double-minded man who's unstable in all he does, and that word that's translated uh, double-minded, that word that's translated double-minded, it's literally double-souled. And this is the first instance of its use that we know about in Greek literature. In James, he uses that same word again in chapter 4, verse 8, and it's possible that he coined it. This idea of double-souled, and it refers to a person who has a divided heart. You see, and I just want you to see this, because sometimes we think, well, if I'm praying, and if I don't have metaphysical certainty that it's God's will in this particular case, that if I, if I think, could God be doing something else in my situation, that though I'm praying for this, well, then God won't hear your prayer at all or care about it. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think he's talking about people whose hearts are divided, who basically are disloyal. And it's that kind of thing here. This person suffers from a basic inconsistency of attitude and spirit. And here's what a commentator, Peter Davids, here's how he summarizes it. He says, the author then concludes his description of the doubter with a strong condemnation. His divided mind when it comes to trusting God indicates a basic disloyalty toward God. Rather than being a single-minded lover of God, he's one whose character and conduct is unstable, even hypocritical. No wonder he should expect nothing from God. He's not in the posture of a trusting child at all. Okay, so that's what I think he's talking about here. But, but see what he's doing. There's a maturing effect of trials, and know that the wisdom that is especially needed in these times is available to you for the asking. And then he says in verses 9 to 12, let the lowly brother boast in his high position, but the rich man in his humiliation, for he will pass away like a flower of the grass. For the sun rose with the searing heat and dried the grass, and its flower fell, and the beauty of its appearance perished. So also the rich man will wither away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures a trial, for having been proven, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him." See, he encourages his readers. Now he's doing it by contrasting their positions and fates. So here you have these, these poor Jewish Christians who are being oppressed by their unbelieving rich neighbors. He's encouraging them in the trials. And what he's going to do here is contrast their positions and their fates. He tells them, look, he, he, he encourages them. He contrasts their exalted position and their glorious future in Christ that's what they have. He says, let the lowly brother boast in his high position. You see, he contrasts their exalted position and glorious future in Christ with the low position and the bleak future of their oppressors. Right? He, he says, look, I understand you're getting the hammer now, but look, you're exalted in Christ. You have a glorious position in, with God in Christ. These people, uh-uh. That's not true of them. You see, however difficult the Christian's life is in this world, he can always boast, 
take pride in. You see his high position to which he's been exalted by God through Christ. And it's fine to boast in God's work. You see, that's what, that's what he's talking about. That you can boast in the high position that they have, that, to which they've been given, or the, the position they've been given, the exaltation they have by God through Christ. But the rich unbeliever, he has nothing to boast about except what his low position in, in the eyes of God. He's into boasting. This guy likes to boast. These rich people like to boast. Well, then let, the, let them go ahead and boast. They like that so much. Let them boast about the fact that they're out of God's favor. Now, this is obviously irony or sarcasm. You into boasting? You want to boast? You boast in, in your exalted position, oppressed believer. And you rich people who are doing this, you rich unbelievers, you go ahead, you're like boasting. You boast in the fact that you're out of favor with God. You see, that's what I think he's doing here. Now, I I think it's a, there's a disagreement I have to just point out to you. There's a scholarly disagreement over whether the rich man here is a rich believer or a rich unbeliever. He seems clearly to me to be a rich unbeliever because of what he says about him. But I just want you to be aware there's a scholarly disagreement about that. And I side with commentators like Peter Davids, Sophie Laws, Ralph Martin, Scott McKnight. All of these guys have written commentaries on, uh, on James. I side with them in thinking that this uh, rich man is a rich unbeliever. That makes the most sense to me. And I think it's very important that as oftentimes verse 12 is ripped away from verses 9 through 11. That's typical. In fact, the editors of the uh, standard Greek text do that. You see it in many translations. A lot of commentators don't do that, though. And I think it's important that it not be taken away. I think that's a mistake because structurally it seems to me to be a unit here. And what's going on is that James mentions the status of the lowly brother in verse 9. That status is he's exalted. Then he mentions in verse 10 the status of the, uh, the, status of the rich man. So it's, it, it's a contrast. Exaltation for the lowly brother, humiliation out of favor, low position, you see, for the rich man. And then he gives the fate of the rich man in the second part of verse 10 and verse 11. He'll perish, he'll wither away. And then, see, so you're left without the balance. Verse 12 is the fate of the lowly brother. He will receive the crown of life. You see, so you have status, status, fate, fate. And so I think it's it's, it's a mistake to pull those away like that because I think they do form a unit. Verse 12 is the parallel of the fate of the rich unbeliever. Now this hope, you know, this hope of eschatological reversal, the hope that in the end God will fix everything. He'll put everything right. This hope of eschatological reversal, it's a common method of encouraging people who are undergoing persecution. The idea you're getting beat, you're getting the hammer, you're suffering, saying, in the end... It's all going to be right. You see, it's all going to be right. God will make it all right. And you see that. We'll see it later in James chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. You see this motif in Philippians chapter 1, verse 28 and 29. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 to 10. Revelation chapters 18 to 22. This idea that though you're getting the hammer now, you're under somebody's foot, things are going to be flipped. You see, you will be glorified. And those who are abusing you and who hate God, they'll get theirs. <laughs> you see, they'll get theirs. And you see this. However difficult things may be in this life, ultimately, ultimately the faithful will be blessed and God's enemies will be judged. Now look here at what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians it's from the TNIV. He says, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They'll be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. So do you see this idea of people having hardships and suffering saying, the day is coming. See, the day is coming when you'll have this flip. You look at Paul's perspective on hardships. 
2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Now, Paul, you know Paul had it. I mean, Paul was persecuted, hounded, beaten, stoned, whipped. I mean, this guy had it. And his perspective on it, he says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18, he says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, but even if our outward man is being wasted away, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. For the lightness of our affliction, which is momentary, is producing for us far beyond all measure an eternal weight of glory. As we focus not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are not seen, for the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. So he looks and says, listen, I understand I'm getting beat all over the place, but I have a perspective on life that says the day is coming. The day is coming. And so I see James employing this same thing to these suffering Christians and saying, there's a maturing effect. God will provide you the wisdom that's especially needed when you're undergoing trials. And by the way, the time is coming when God will bless those who are faithful to him and those who oppose him, those who happen to be persecuting you right now, and they will be condemned. And so you see him. He'll do this again in James chapter 5. And then he warns them in, in chapter 1, verses 13 through 18. He then warns them because he's on this thing about the trials he's talking to them about. And the way I understand this, he warns them in chapter 1, verse 13 through verse 18 against slandering God during trials. And he says in verses 13 to 15, he says, Let no one being tested say, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. Rather, each man is tempted by being dragged away and enticed by his own desires. Then the desire, after conceiving, gives birth to sin, and sin, when fully grown, brings forth death. So I look at him here that he's saying, listen, don't ascribe evil intent to God. See, in the midst of persecution and other trials, it is easy to feel like God has become an enemy. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but it's easy to feel like God has become an enemy when you're getting the hammer, when you're being persecuted and enduring trials. You can feel that he's trying to drive you away from him by driving you to sin. That has to be what he's doing. He's trying to drive me to sin to drive me away from him. You can feel that way. You know, I mean, because there are times you simply cannot understand what is happening. I'm faithful, I do this, you know, I love God, I serve God, and yet my child died. Now you have some people say, no, if you're faithful, your child will never die. All right, I just consider that crazy. Okay? That's how I look at that. The idea that, no, 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 if you're a Christian, see, God will insulate you from all suffering, and if you get sick or you get cancer, your child suffers, that's an indication that you don't really believe. That lasts until something happens to their child. And I also think it's just flat out not biblical. Okay, but in any event, you see this idea there is this, when you're suffering, it is easy to think and to, in your heart and to begin to think God is against me. He's trying to drive me away from him, trying to drive me towards sin. So James warns his audience who's undergoing these things. He warns his audience not to slander God in the midst of their trials by claiming that God is against them, that he's trying to induce them to sin. You see, and that's that's what he's talking about there in, in verse 13. He warns those being tested, being tested, see, undergoing trials, not to say that they're being tempted by God. Those being tested are not to say that they're being tempted by God. And this Greek word, perazzo, it has both both the good sense of testing and the bad sense of tempting. They're just both part of the word. That's just how it is. That's how English is. That's how words are. They have both of these connotations. They have the good sense of testing, and that word has the good sense of testing and the bad sense of tempting. And the distinction has to be recognized here. So that's why it's done. Let no one being tested say, I'm being tempted by God. 
You see, don't, you don't do that. The cross of Christ, if nothing else, does not the cross of Christ make absolutely, completely, abundantly, and forever clear that God is for us? Right? I mean, doesn't that say, however, the, you know, all of the pain and the suffering and the turmoil and the smoke that exist in this life, can't we look to the cross and see that whatever else it looks like, I am absolutely confident that God is committed to my welfare to death. You see, that shouts across the centuries, I am committed to you so much that I had my one and only son die for you. Okay, so see, you're in the storm, in the storm, you say, that cross, that cross tells me, I, I, it looks this way, it looks like he's my enemy. It looks like he's opposed to me. It looks like he's driving me to sin and to leave and to get away. But you say, I know that's not true. It must be my perception of, of events because I know that God is for me. See, God tests his children. But he never tempts them. And the distinction is one of motivation. He tests them, but he doesn't tempt them. God permits hardship in the life of a believer, but he never does that with hostile motives. He never does so for the purpose of leading them to evil, saying, here's what I want from them. I want them to be evil. I want them to sin. That's what I'm trying to What kind of a God is that? He tests but he doesn't tempt. And the reason, the, the difference is in the motivations. He allows us to carry weight to strengthen us, not to cause us to sin. Now, Douglas Moo says in his commentary, while God may test or prove his servants in order to strengthen their faith, he never seeks to induce sin and destroy their faith. Now, you have to recognize that from a God who gave his son. If he loves us so much and he's committed to us so much that he gave his son, how can you think he tries to drive us away and wants us to sin and become evil? But it's tempting to do that when you're suffering. Suffering is this cloud, this darkness that comes. And see, we sometimes have to, we can't allow the horror of the scene, the horror of the experience to cause us to doubt what we know is true. And that's one of the things that can happen with this. Now, he says, if they sin, it's not because God willed it. That's not what he wants. Rather, it's because they fail to control their own desires. They fail to control their own desires. That's the root of it. That's where the blame, that's where the blame falls. Now, this idea of that sin comes from their failing to control their own desires it raises a number of questions, okay? And I'm not going to chase the rabbit too long, but I want to mention some of the questions because that's not what James is about. But when we see this, it raises questions for us, and I at least want to point to some of these things. You have this idea, well, is, is, in, is temptation caused by evil desire? You see, is it caused by evil desire, by some warped or inordinate desire, some kind of inappropriate, ungodly desire, like the NIV says, evil desire. Uh, many translations say lust, you see, which has this connotation of this inordinate, uh, inappropriate desire. Well, the Greek word, epithumia, it can have a neutral sense. It can have a neutral sense, but its most common and typical New Testament sense is as an illicit desire, an inappropriate desire. Uh, you know, a, a, a kind of warped, bad desire. Well, if it here has that sense, if it has that sense of an inappropriate, wrong, ungodly desire, well, then that explains why God cannot be tempted. I mean, that would be, that's clear, because he doesn't have that kind of desire. So that's why he couldn't be tempted. But if temptation is produced by an illicit or inappropriate desire, if that's the source of, of temptation, then Hebrews 4.15 must mean that Jesus was tested in every way rather than he was tempted in every way. Because if you say that the basis of temptation is some kind of wrong, inappropriate, evil desire, 
well, then it seems, you know, you wouldn't be saying that Jesus was tempted because that would mean that Jesus had an evil, inappropriate desire. And I don't see that. Okay, so you, then you would say, okay, if it goes that way, well, then Hebrews 4.15 would better be understood as that Jesus was tested in every way. His tests never led him to sin because his desires were not such as would lead to temptation to sin. Just like God, you'd say, okay. No, he's just like God the Father, is that there was no... Uh, inappropriate or wrong element in his heart or desire, so therefore it didn't lead to his temptation to sin. Now, or is, so is, is temptation, is this an evil desire? Is that the right way to understand it? Or is temptation caused by neutral desire? You see, by a desire that's in no way tainted or inappropriate. Is it, is it caused by that kind of desire? Well, if that's correct, if it's if, if it just caused by a neutral, proper, appropriate desire, well, in, in that case, Hebrews 4.15 may mean that Jesus was tempted to sin in every way, but he never succumbed to the temptation. See, then that would be, that would be a way to understand Hebrews 4.15. In that view, that raises the question, though, you say, okay, well, why was Jesus, God the Son, subject to temptation when God the Father is not? Okay, you say, well, all right, that that sounds like a good question. If the desire that leads to temptation, if that desire is neutral, not culpable, uh, simply a typical, fine, common desire, uh, if that desire that leads to temptation is neutral, doesn't God have desires? A desire to be glorified and other things? So you say, doesn't God have desires? Well, if one says that, so so you say, well, then how do you distinguish these? If Jesus is tempted and God is not tempted, and if the, des- the desire is neutral, you say, well, wait a minute, uh, how do you distinguish them? You can say, well, the desires that lead to temptation, maybe they're human desires. So maybe they're human desires, the desires of the flesh to which only God the Son is subjected. But that seems to me, anyway, to cast a negative light on physical creation that I'm not sure is consonant with Scripture. So I don't, I don't know if that's the right way, right way to go. Now, if James 1.13 means, if you say, well, that means that God cannot be tempted. That's the right way to understand it. I think then maybe option one is better, that it's this idea of an evil kind of desire and taking that route that I tried to explain. But James 1.13 may not mean that God cannot be tempted. I know that's how it's always read and always translated, but it's possible it doesn't mean that. The operative word there, it appears nowhere else in the Greek New Testament, And this is the first known occurrence of the word in all of Greek literature. So you have this question, and how do you get to what the word is about? James 1.13, it possibly means that God is inexperienced in evil things. Okay, that's one person thinks that's the better way of understanding it. It's possible it means that God ought not be tested by evil persons. Okay, so I'm I'm just throwing out to you, Real quickly, I'm just raising some of these questions that come up when you talk about the source of temptation and how to understand this desire because there are implications that flow from how you take that, you see? And so then you have to chase those down and they require some fitting into your theological structure, okay? So I'm just trying to bring those, bring those up. Now, if, if, uh, if you take one of those things in, in 113, that if it doesn't mean God cannot be tempted, but means one of those other options like God is inexperienced in evil things or ought not be tested by evil persons, well, if either of those is correct, then maybe option two is the better idea, that, it, that it's a neutral desire. See, if temptation arises from neutral desire, then being tempted carries absolutely no stigma, right? There's, nothing, there, there's no stigma to it. There's nothing wrong. If the desire is neutral... Then the thing is, the only question would be, did you fall to the temptation? If the desire that gives rise to the temptation is somehow illicit, well, then the very temptation itself says something about the person's character. All right, all of that, I don't know if that's worth anything to you, but uh, I throw that out there. James isn't concerned with those issues. Okay, yes. Okay, sounds good. (laughs) Well, it's, uh, it depends, It, it what I was addressing here is when he says each man is tempted by being dragged away and enticed by his own desires. Well, yeah, that's true. But the question I was trying to get at or raise as a possible issue is if 
is the source of the temptation when it says it enticed by his own desires. He says the origin and source of temptation is your own desires. Does that mean your own evil desires, the way the NIV translates it, or does it mean neutral desires that are non-culpable? Yes, I think, I think we're using neutral in a different way, but yeah, no, I think uh, what you said first, I agree with. She said that, I don't know if you heard her, she said that uh, she's always looked at it as though Satan is the one who tempts and God tests us for our benefit. Satan's motivation, that's right, he's the tempter. And he's trying to get us to succumb, to fall, to go against God. And God tests us to strengthen us, to bless us. And so I think that's right. I was just chasing a little rabbit here that, you know, maybe I shouldn't have said anything about. But these things, these things come up to me, and I figure they come up to other people, and I at least want to do it. And, and if what I said was confusing about that, the notes, you can go look at the notes, and maybe they'll be less confusing. But they're, they're online, and you can take a look. But I, I want to make clear, James, see, he's not thinking about this. That was just my little rabbit and my little footnote. Okay, James isn't thinking about it. His point And what he's saying to his readers, his point is that if uncontrolled, our desire will lead us beyond temptation and into actual sin and that the responsibility for that sin rests on our shoulders. Now, if there's ever a message that a society needs to hear, it is our society. Because we have become masters at saying that people who do wrong, it's not their fault. And we've done that because we are, we are convinced that is, what, that is how it is to be compassionate. Is that I'm compassionate by relieving you of your responsibility for the wrong you did. Okay? And I think that's just unbiblical. Not the idea of being compassionate, of course that's biblical, but the idea of doing it at the price of saying, you're not responsible. It's not your fault. You didn't have anything to do with it. You're just a robot. And you're a victim of circumstances. Look at the circumstances they're under. And so James tells him, he says, listen, you know, this is on your shoulders. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God is faithful. He will not let you be tested beyond what you can bear. But when you're tested, he will also provide a way out so you can stand up under it. You see, and we cannot excuse our sinning by blaming God or our circumstances, however sorely we're being tested. We can't do that. And yet, as I say, you know, even, even shows where they're sitting here, they, they, they're portraying, you know, serial killers. The thrust of the show is what happened to the serial killer when he was four. How does his dad treat him? You see, so we can wind up saying, well, you know, he's just a product. Well, I understand that, you know, the world is full of sin and pressures and things like that that beat us all and bend us all. But none of that absolves us of the responsibility for what we do. You see, sin is when we choose, when we wind up giving in and saying yes. And James is telling his audience, these Jewish Christians, that they can't, you know, wind up saying, listen, we're going to blame God or distance ourselves from our responsibility. He warns them in the second part of verse 15 that this is serious business. This is serious business, that there's grave danger in yielding to temptation. Now, why can James say that, warn them about the grave danger of yielding to temptation, the Spirit of God, and if we say it today, we're legalistic? What is up with this? This is what the Bible says. Giving in to sin and yielding to sin is not some ho-hum. What do you care? I got grace. I don't care. You see, it's serious business. And we have to tell people that and warn people about that and warn each other about it. Why? Is it because we can sit here and go, you know, I'm so much more spiritual than you. Uh, Oh, you know, I don't. No. It's because we care about each other and we recognize that there's a grave danger in this. So what we wind up doing is rather than endure or risking Somebody getting upset with us or resenting us, we just keep quiet and let them go along. Now, is that loving people? See, I don't see it that way. That's not loving people. That's being selfish because you're not telling them there's a grave danger in succumbing to sin or to temptation and yielding to that. 
He says that, you know, see, that sinning is the first step on a road that leads to death. Succumbing to sin, yielding to it, is the first step on a road that leads to death. If sin is unchecked, if it's allowed to become fully grown, allowed to realize its designs on one's life. You see, what does he say here? Then desire after conceiving gives birth to sin, and sin when? When it's fully grown. You see, when sin is fully grown, after, it has, after it's been unchecked, it's realized its designs on one, one's life, what will it do? It brings forth death. Now, he's writing to Christians. Isn't he? He's writing to Jewish Christians. And he's warning them that this is... And you say, well, you know, they're being persecuted and they're having a hard time. So isn't he being mean and saying this? Isn't that how we tend to look at it? And you say, no, he's loving them by warning them about the dangers that they're facing. One will be cut off from the life of God, alienated from him, which ultimately will result in one's condemnation at the final judgment. See, when we sin, we have to take it seriously, and we have to repent rather than wallow in it, or it will become fully grown. It will become the master of our lives. That's the idea. Sin is a monster. And if you go in and just flirt with him and then start embracing him, he will swallow you. And we don't think that. No, we think, no, that's fine. You know, just, it's okay. You know, do whatever you want. Live however you want. Shack up. Do this. None of that matters. And it's just crazy. <laughs> From a biblical perspective, it's just crazy. See, when we sin, we need to repent to keep the sin from becoming fully grown, a life of sin as opposed to a life of faith will result in judgment. You say, how can he possibly say this to Christians? How can he say that to It's all over the Bible. What do you mean, how can he say it to them? The link between sin and death is well known in the New Testament. You see that everywhere. And in Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 14, Paul warns the Roman Christians that they would die in the full theological sense if they fell back into a lifestyle of the flesh, living like a non-Christian. If you fall back into a lifestyle of the flesh, you will die. You see, he warns them, clearly. But not only the, not only the Roman Christians, he made the same point to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, 10, 1 to 13, to the Galatians. 5, 19 to 21, 6, 7, and 8 to the Ephesians. Ephesians 5, 3 to 7 to the Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 8. It's not like it's a secret. It's not like it's some kind of obscure thing. Well, you're sure that you're getting the nuance of that right? It's everywhere. And the idea James is telling these people who are being oppressed, he says, listen, listen, you, this is serious business. You don't want to lapse into this thing and start criticizing or, or blaspheming God or attributing this evil intent to God. He says this is serious business that he talks about sin and being pulled into it. And if you pull into it and you embrace it, if you get pulled into sin and you marry it, you understand what I'm saying? You say, you saying you don't sin? And I get tired of saying this. Of course I sin. I'm a sinner. My heart is committed not to doing it. You understand the difference between somebody who says, listen, yes, I like this. I like getting drunk. You see? I'm not going to quit it. Not I'm going to quit it and struggle with it. No, no, I'm not going to quit it. I like having sex even though I'm not married. It's fun. It's enjoyable. I'm just not going to stop it. Do you see a difference in a person who says, listen, I'm not going to live and be and do anything that God doesn't want me to do. Now, in that commitment, do we stumble? Yes, but do you recognize the difference between stumbling in a commitment and rejecting the commitment? If you don't, I don't know how you can be married. Right? Anybody who's married is committed? Have you perfectly fulfilled your commitment? Have you always treated your wife the way you should have? Well, maybe you have. But I'd be shocked. <laughs> but does that mean that you have broken your commitment with your wife? No. 
You see, the falling takes place within that commitment. That is a completely different thing. Okay, so he's telling them here that this is serious business. And we need to say to the world, to Christians, this is serious business. However that makes us look. You say, oh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to hear fire and brimstone. I want to hear the Bible. That's what I want to hear. The Bible. Rightly understood, okay? Not sit here taken out and ripped out and thrown out and just made up. I want to hear careful, articulate exposition because I want to hear the Word of God, right? So when people say, oh, you can't say that kind of stuff, if the Bible says it, we say it, right? Okay, that's, at least you know how I feel about it. <laughs> All right, if the Bible says it, then we need to say it, and we need to say it without apology. Okay, James warns him of that. Now, that, that link there, here's how Peter expressed it, and I heard that bell, so it'll go soon. Peter in 2 Peter 2, 17 to 22. He says, these men are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm for whom the gloom of darkness has been reserved. For while uttering high-sounding words of nonsense, they entice with lusts of the flesh, acts of licentiousness, those who are barely escaping from those who live in error, promising them freedom while themselves being slaves of corruption. For by what someone has been overcome... To this he has become enslaved. For if after escaping the pollutions of the world by the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are overcome by again becoming entangled in these things, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it was better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn from the holy commandment that had been passed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow after being washed to wallowing in the mud. Now, can we say that? Yeah, we can. You see, and so this is what James is saying. James is warning them of the danger of succumbing and yielding to temptation. Is there mercy? Is there forgiveness? The, always open to the penitent. Okay? Always, God is always open to the penitent. The danger is, is when you grab that monster, you see, that monster can take you away where you will not be penitent. Because that monster... He sell, he's got a lot of trinkets, and he's got a lot of little shiny things that he can keep you mesmerized, and that's the warning, is that you have to treat this stuff seriously because it can have deadly consequences. I heard that. Thank you.